looking back on it, when we were making Fear of a Black Planet, hell yeah, we knew we was making something that wasn't done. Back then, we definitely knew what was not being done. So we said, you know, <clears throat> we're gonna take this road, and this road's gonna take us somewhere. We know it's gonna take us somewhere. There's no traffic on this road anyway. But well, welcome to the Terror Dome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. And thank you for subscribing to the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm 12 Kyle. Check this out on this podcast. We're going to take it back. We're going all the way back to April 10th, 1990. On that day, the group Public Enemy released their third album. That album was called Fear of a Black Planet. We're going to talk about it as it celebrates its 30 year anniversary. So, sit tight, we'll drop the music, and then we'll get the podcast jumping. Let's get it. Where is Public Enemy? What's the deal? What's your latest hit, brother? Fear of a Black Planet. An outrage is a rap music group called Public Enemy. But these days, America is on a hair trigger. And Public Enemy is taking some incoming fire of its own. It is music that is becoming more and more popular. So you should decide for yourself. Is this art or dangerous propaganda? And just like that, we are back. As I mentioned in the intro, we are taking it back to 1990. Uh, April... 10th 1990 on that day public enemy dropped fear of a black planet um it's really crazy just thinking about this album uh in that context because i guess the first thing that it lets me know as i you know talk about the 30 year anniversary of that album i'm getting old <laughs> I mean, like if you were around for this album, you know, if you were around for the release of it and when it actually came out. Yeah, you you probably share the same sentiment like, yo, we're really, really getting old. Right. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, man, this was. Uh, it's, it's bugged out to think about it because I remember how and what music looked and sound sounded like at that particular time. And um to be honest, uh, I was so excited to get this album. Uh, as I mentioned, Public Enemy, this was their third album that they had released. Uh, the first album, Yo Bum Rush's Show. Um, phenomenal album. Phenomenal album. Some, you know, hold it in high regard and then almost give it that C word. <laughs> I don't, but I, I I think it's right. It might be a step below. Um, their second album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which dropped in 1988, the greatest year in hip hop. It's a classic. And um, so Public Enemy, honestly, were two for two in my book. Uh, and then we rolled up on this album, Fear of a Black Planet uh, in 1990. Uh, this album was recorded from June of 1989 to February of 1990. Uh, when this album dropped, I want to say I was a junior in high school. <laughs> so uh, my appreciation for this album is extremely deep, and I'll touch on that as well. But um this was uh this this was a very pivotal point for Public Enemy because uh honestly they blew the doors off of everything with it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Uh that is for me just on a personal note one of my favorite hip hop albums period. It's one of my favorite albums of any genre. Um and obviously there was a lot of critical and commercial success and, and critics loved it and the streets loved it. And it was just, it was everywhere. Um, but 
you know how it goes uh, when you have the kind of success that they had. Uh, people want to, you know, they want to know, can you do it again? You know, um, can you, you know, repeat what it was that made you the success that, you know, you became, um, you know, so this album had a lot leading up to it. I mean, public enemy was public enemy was riding the strength of, like I said, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Um, they also weren't without controversy. Uh, you know, as many of you know, one of the members of the group, uh, Professor Griff, um, I want to say Professor Griff in 1989 uh, was very, he was interviewed and he made some uh, anti-Semitic remarks in an interview with the Washington Times. He said that the Jews were, quote, the majority of the wickedness in the world. And of course, there was a lot of media scrutiny and, you know, a lot of public backlash. And of course, this is before social media. So it's just not, you know, that it wasn't something that was just going to blow over. And uh, ultimately, you know, Public Enemy had to make a decision. And, um, you know, Chuck D, uh, the leader of Public Enemy, decided to part ways with um, Professor Griff. Uh, but he later, you know, rejoin the group and, um, you know, apologize or whatever like that. So it was a lot of stuff going on, you know, leading up to this album. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on in hip hop. And honestly, hip hop had or rap, if you will, was making the change from, uh, you know, these simplistic lyrics to uh, for a lot of people especially young impressionable minds like myself, they were introducing uh, certain forms of Afro Afrocentrism um, and, you know, introducing us to political figures, uh, the Marcus Garvey's, the Asada, Shakur, Asada Shakur's, uh, the, um, the political figures that we would, you know, come to be recognized. Um, people like definitely people like Minister Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam. So when you had uh, all of those things and the backdrop of, uh, you know, social and political things that were happening through the country and, you know, really in the world, to be honest, uh, that was a, in a lot of ways the backdrop of the creation of this album. So you had so many social things going. So you knew that Public Enemy was going to speak on so many things that was happening in society and, and, and particularly in the black community. So we had all of that going. And again, they're coming off the uh, <laughs> the classic album. So it's like, OK, what is P.E. going to do? Um, and I mean, I shouldn't have to tell you, but the members of the group uh, Public Enemy was obviously Chuck D., uh, Flavor Flav, uh, Terminator X, and the S1Ws, um, and as well as Professor Griff. Uh, so I think really looking back on it, I just just as a fan, we were anticipating uh, something dope, but you really don't know how an album is going to sound based on you know what you had the last time, and we knew that you know. Public Enemy's work with the Bomb Squad was going to be critical. Um, and I'll be honest, <laughs> this album didn't disappoint at all. Uh, the first time I heard it, I was just like blown away because, you know, I was one of the few people that I I just I I had a certain level of expectation. Like I didn't say, oh, man, it's going to be a classic. I didn't say that at all. But I just knew based on what they gave us from Yo Bum Rush to show to it, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. I didn't think that they were going to, you know, slip and fall off at all. Um, one of the first things that stands out about this album, obviously, is the production. Uh, this album was produced by the world famous Bomb Squad um, and the Bomb Squad, you know, <laughs> for my money's worth, has never disappointed. Uh, the Bomb Squad consists of uh, Keith Shockley, uh, Eric Sadler and Hank Shockley. Um, and so, you know, 
I just knew that they weren't going to like half step. And when you listen to this album um, sonically, the production is um, it's really crazy. They what they did was a lot of stuff was experimental, uh, but it also it was a lot of different type of vibes that were fused together. You had a little bit of rock and roll. You had a little bit of, um, you know, just that raw hip hop. Um, but then you had these futuristic sounds that really meshed with uh, Chuck D's voice. And, and I, I think when you add all of that together and you add Chuck D's voice, which really isn't talked about a lot. I mean, like people will always talk about their top or greatest hit, greatest MCs of all time. And Chuck Chuck's name rarely gets mentioned, but his voice uh, is the I always say his voice is the sound of hip hop. And like you would want <laughs> if you were an MC, you wanted to sound like Chuck D because his voice was just so I guess the best way I can describe his voice was piercing through all of the beats. And um, they didn't disappoint, man. They from every track and I'll, and I'll get into the, the track listing and breaking the tracks down. But, you know, Fear of a Black Planet was, you know, conceived in the what we call the golden era of hip hop. Um, and so it didn't one first and foremost, Public Enemy doesn't they don't <laughs> they don't look like anybody else. Right. And then also the sound of music doesn't sound like anything else. Like there's a distinct, there's a distinction between a public enemy record and, uh, you know, a heavy D record or, uh, Kara's one record. And they just, they were trailblazers. They really were. And, um, you know, this album doesn't disappoint from a production side. Uh, I think, when you listen to what it is that Chuck D's rhyming about, uh, the subject matter, uh, whether it be uh, 911 is a joke where they're poking fun and bringing awareness to the emergency system, uh, response systems that we had in this country where people were literally dying, uh, waiting on 911 to come to neighborhoods to, to help out people who were sick or wounded. Um, from that to Welcome to the Terror Dome, which is one of the hardest uh, hip hop songs <laughs> that you'll ever hear. Uh, the production was crazy, man. Like they they blended a lot of different things. And, and I, I don't think the Bomb Squad, uh, when you talk about, you know, hip hop producers, uh, real heads know, but I don't think they they get the love that they probably should get uh, when you mention their their work. But um, this album uh, sonically was incredible it it's not as good sonically in my opinion as uh it takes a nation of millions and that's no slouch because if if you say that that's a classic and this isn't far from it then i think production wise you still have done very well and um this album was incredible sonically it, it's not something that i think you I think even listening to it back in 1990, I don't think we really, really understood or appreciated some of the sounds that we were hearing. But, um, you know, uh, once again, an incredible, incredible album. Um, this album, as I mentioned a little earlier, was well received, uh, not only from the streets, but from critics as well. Uh, it was an album, I think that if I'm not mistaken, this album went platinum, maybe double platinum. Uh, ultimately, but, um, you know, it was an album that was well received. And, and to be honest, it, you know, public enemy, they're not a group that is looking for, uh, album sales. Um, but it was a commercial success and they did it in a time where, you know, you're trying to get across a message or messages and you're not necessarily looking for the charts, but the charts are picking you up and the streets are, is loving you. And, and, and that's that's a very delicate balance to have. And I thought that this album was was very critical and, and did just that. Um, but, yeah, it was it was well received. Uh, there were some hip hop heads that, you know, wanted to compare it to It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. 
honestly, I don't think that you can compare the two because Public Enemy was in two different places when they made that album. This album was actually nominated for a Grammy uh, for Best Rap Duo or Group um, in 1991. So uh, even with all of that, you know, it, it wasn't they didn't fall off. I'll put it like that. <laughs> they didn't fall off at all. But this was a very, very great album. And um, honestly, it's an album even to this day that I, I, I don't get tired of hearing. Ironically enough, when I listen to it, Takes a Nation of Means to Hold Us Back, I always listen to Fear of a Black Planet right behind it because I think they kind of go together. Um, where it takes the nation's ends, that's where Fear of a Planet picks up. Um, but yeah, it, it was a phenomenal album. And it's one album I would, I, I always encourage people to, if you haven't heard it before or you haven't listened to it in a while, uh, sit down and listen to it and vibe to it. It's not something that's, you know, that you need to just bang in your car or your, your, (laughs) or in your stereo or whatever, when you're working out. Um, It is definitely something that is thought provoking. It is definitely something that will, uh, at least for us at the particular time, again, I was a junior in high school, so it helped raise the, you know, black consciousness. And, and and for a, a young person like myself, it talked about different subject matters to the, you know, from everything from the Bush administration to apartheid in South Africa. And what it did was it just, it really opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. I mean, I grew up, most of you know, I grew up in South Carolina, so I wasn't necessarily privy to, while I knew a lot and didn't have obviously the, (laughs) the internet, uh, what I read and, and, and what it did was it listening to this music made me want to learn more. Um, I didn't know that much about, you know, Farrakhan. I didn't know much about the 5% Nation or anything like that. And, um, you know, I think this album was very critical for young people, you know, not necessarily to convert people, but just to expose them to things that we necessarily didn't think about at the time. So uh, for that, I definitely will always uh, salute Chuck D, Public Enemy, the Bomb Squad and everybody uh, associated with this album. Uh, I tell you what, let's take a quick commercial break. Uh, We'll hear from Chuck D. And on the other side, we'll break down this album, break down the tracks. And uh, I'll tell you if it is a classic or not. Sit tight. We'll be back in just a second. Takes the Nations was our nation record. Fear of the Black Planet was our world record. And what surprises me even to this day is when people come around and say, you know what, Fear of a Black Planet touched me and, and, and kind of dragged me into Nations. But really, it touched me. You know, it touched me in a different way. Nations that I wanted to, you know, fight and kick some ass. But fear just made me actually just sit for a second and be humble to the to the to the power of the universe, and then you know, kind of focus my attention on defense. Welcome to Terror Dome is my favorite song, only because of it dealt with an issue of a particular period that was very personal to me. But you know, the most important record that Public Enemy has done. And continues to use it as a closer. Fight the power. Spike Lee put the, that song in the movie eight times. It meant a lot of people, you know, a lot of things to a lot of people. And it was written to be an anthem, and it was written at a particular time that needed an anthem, not just in the movie, but just in the time of the people. And just like that, we are back. Once again, it's your boy, 12 Kyle. This is the 12 Kyle podcast, and we're taking it back. We're talking about the 30 year anniversary of Fear of a Black Planet by Public Enemy. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, man, it it's hard to believe that this album is actually 30 years old. Um but as I mentioned before the break, uh, I was going to come back and talk about the tracks. So uh, let's get to it. This album is, I think the running time is a little more than an hour, uh, like an hour and three minutes. Um, and there's 20 tracks, including interludes. Um, <laughs> honestly, they probably could have shortened it up. That's just me. But I don't 
disapprove of the tracks that they have. Uh, looking back on it, they probably could have cut out a, a track or two here or there, but everything is is properly placed, so I get it. Um, I'm just saying this, you know, now, but you know, when the album dropped in 1990, I was here for it, <laughs> so uh, don't mind me. Um, the album starts off with track one, "Contract on the World Love Jam," um, more of an interlude uh, than anything else, uh, but it's really a track that actually sets the tone and sets the stage for what is to come uh then we get into track two uh brother's gonna work it out man (laughs) this song when you hear that riff that guitar riff from uh prince's when doves cry i think um yeah, it's from When Doves Cry. Uh, that let me know right there that they weren't playing, right? Uh, the Bomb Squad wasn't playing. Chuck D wasn't playing. Um, I remember they shot a video for this. They shot the video. I want to say, was that video shot in, I think it was shot in on a beach. Uh, I want to, it might have been uh, Atlantic City, I think. Uh, anywhere there was some place where there was a, a recent uprising uh, at the time of the video, um, but whatever be I don't know it was some beach in in New Jersey or whatever, um, and so they decided to shoot it there. But um, the video was really really dope. If you haven't seen that video, check it out. But just the theme, brothers gonna work it out. It was just talking about you know us uniting it and and just fighting against the enemy, um, and. Chuck D's incredible, man. I mean, his voice, like I told you earlier, his voice is just just cuts through these tracks. But I mean, this is a wild ass. It's like you got a sample from Prince. You got a sample from George Clinton. um, And he he just crushes it. I mean, like (laughs) this is one of my favorite tracks on the album, man. Brother's going to work it out. Um, So I just remember And it's interesting because like when I listen to this album, when I hear Brothers Gonna Work It Out, I always go back to the first time that I heard it. And I just remember listening. I bought the tape back in 1990 and I remember sitting there like, what the hell is this? Like, and I don't mean I didn't say what the hell is this in a derogatory manner. I mean, like I wasn't you. You don't hear those. You don't hear a guitar riff. And that banging beat and, you know, Chuck's voice. And you're like, OK, this ain't it takes us a nation to millions to hold us back. Like this is something totally different. And it's out of here and it's crazy. And it sounds so dope. Right. So we go from that track to track three. Nine one one is a joke. Um, this is flavors joint, man. For you, if you, if you, for me with public enemy, uh, Chuck does most of the rhyming flavors, the hype man, but every now and then, you know, on a, on an album, they'll give flavor a song or two and let him, let him rock with it. And, um, this was his joint. Uh, nine one one is a joke. And as I mentioned before the break, uh, this song basically talked about, you know, the emergency system. And at the time that they were recording this, this was a huge, huge issue in a lot of inner cities, particularly in black communities where uh, people were, you know, becoming ill and needed, you know, they would call 911 and the emergency people would just take their own sweet time, particularly if you lived in the hood. I mean, so imagine someone having a heart attack and you call 911 and you're saying, okay, well, hey, I need somebody to come get, you know, John, he's had a heart attack and I'm on this street, blah, blah, blah. And I'm on two on one Main Street. And they're like, OK, well, you're on two on one Main Street. And they know automatically that that's the projects. And they just take their own sweet time in the hospital where it might where it probably should take them, you know, five, six minutes to get there is taking them 20, maybe 30 minutes to get there. And there were quite a few cases in, I know, New York City at the time uh, where people died because the emergency dispatcher for whatever reason did not get an ambulance to them or an ambulance didn't get there quick enough 
and the person died either on the way to the hospital. Some died on the spot, you know, and it was uh, and, and, and so that was very, very tough. And I mean, you have to also have to keep in the mind of the context of this song, because uh, at the time, crack was everywhere. Right. We were in the middle of the crack epidemic. So uh, and, you know, people don't talk about it, but crack spread like wildfire through, you know, the inner cities and, and particularly in the black community. And so, you know, then you had these these wars on the street with, you know, gangs and, and people, you know, fighting over turf and everything like that. So, you know, we needed emergency, our, our emergency responses to be quick. And, um, you know, 911 was a joke. And, you know, Flav, you know, very eloquently, even though even in Hall, his antics, you know, he really delivered a serious message about the uh, the ineffectiveness of, of, of the 911 emergency phone calls. Um, so that was really, really a dope track. Uh, then we moved to track four, uh, Incident at 66.6 FM. Um, this is a radio station that they went to and you actually heard people calling in mad at Public Enemy. Right, right. So you had that kind of stuff going on. And so I remember hearing it for the first time. And the first time I heard it, I was like, this can't be real. But it really did happen. And I'm like, that's from a real live show. So that was crazy in and of itself. So my mind is, you know, I'm trying to wrap myself around that interlude. And it's interlude because it's only a minute, 37 seconds. Then we move into track five welcome to the terror dome hands down my favorite track on the album um man <laughs> this is one of the hardest hip-hop songs in my opinion ever like when that beat comes on you just know like it's it's everything um what Chuck was rap, rapping about. That's really where we were. You felt like you were in a, I guess the best way I can describe it. Like it sounds like you're in a war and that's what it was. It's like we were in a war at that particular time, not a war as far as fighting um, the enemy, but you know, fighting ourselves and fighting everything around us and, and also trying to fight off the enemy, whatever the enemy, whatever we deem the enemy to be. Um, Phenomenal track, phenomenal track, phenomenal track. Uh, then we move to track six, uh, Meet the G That Kill Me. Uh, it's an interlude. It's only 44 seconds, but they are talking about, you know, having uh, AIDS and it being spread through, uh, you know, intravenously and then, you know, having sex with someone and they are HIV positive because at that time, you know, if you we didn't really differentiate between HIV and AIDS. It was just, you know, it, it was, if you had HIV, you were going to die. If you had AIDS, you were going to die. And there was no such thing in, in our mind as living uh, life for any particular amount of time if you had that disease. So uh, very, very integral interlude. Uh, then we moved to track seven. Polly want a cracker. Man. <laughs> <laughs> this one was very controversial, but very, very interesting at the same time. Uh, this one dealt with interracial relationships. Uh, it also dealt with you, you hear back and forth, um, you know, between a man and a woman talking about, you know, what. I guess what was big at that particular time was when we would talk about, you know, selling out um, and. You know, I've heard Chuck D talk about it where, you know, the song was made to kind of put up a mirror for a lot of people at the time. Uh, not so much as, you know, black men who decided to date out of their race, but outside of their race, but to, for black men who would purposely say, like, I'm not into black women, you know, like that type of thing. So uh, that one. uh <laughs> drew the ire of a lot of people but um 
even in that little clip that you hear, you also hear, you know, what we were taught in school about, you know, what considers, you know, what makes someone black. If you had a drop of black blood, then you were considered to be black. Doesn't matter how light your skin was. Um, and uh, that also dealt with the three fifths, uh, you know, concept and everything like that. So it's very, very even in this song is very, very historical. Um, then we move to track eight, Anti Nigger Machine. Um, interestingly enough, they only rap for about a minute and a half on this, um, but it's still another dope track as well. Then we go to the <laughs> posse cut, if you will, track nine, Burn Hollywood Burn, featuring Big Daddy Kane and Ice Cube. Um, man, I love this joint, man. Another favorite, favorite track of mine. Um, it was dope, man. Just to see Kane and Ice Cube on, you know, on a, on a, a bomb squad joint with uh, Chuck D. And, um, of course you got flavor on there as well. Uh, I think, and this song is <laughs> what's criminal about this song. The song is only two minutes and 47 seconds. It really should have been a lot longer than that. But uh, they did a video for it and everything. And they just talked about how, you know, the roles in Hollywood, you know, really was, uh, you know, we didn't like it. You know, we we were getting these roles as maids and servants and things of that nature. And we weren't getting roles uh, like the roles that Spike Lee was doing in his movies and things of that nature. And what we wanted, what, what they were asking for was just a piece of the pie, you know, equal representation. We don't want to be you know, always be the criminal on, on a TV show or something like that, or the bad guy, you know, we want, we want to be the good guys. And when I say we, I'm speaking as black people. Um, so really for them to touch on, you know, the stereotypes and typecasting in Hollywood was, uh, was very, very key. So, uh, uh, burn Hollywood burn definitely is one of my favorite joints. Um, the next joint was uh, power to the people, uh, power to the people kind of reminds me of, uh, <laughs> kind of reminds me like of a funked up church song funked up gospel song uh another banger um and you know it's just a rallying cry power to the people bringing people together re, uh uniting them together uh for the common cause and pushing them forward uh then we move to track uh 11 who stole the soul um one of the things that I always found interesting about this track is that they talk about really about how soul music was, you know, stolen. I mean, taken, you know, it was the the acts like James Brown and people in the 60s, you know, the music was stolen. Their music was stolen from them and they really never got the credit they, that they should have from people like that to, you know, Elvis. Uh, and, and we already know. <laughs> know how public feel public enemy feels about elvis but um that album i mean that song was very critical because uh what it did was for someone like me it talked about some you know soul singers like wilson pickett who i had heard of them and i may have heard their music but really wasn't familiar with them and what it did was it made me research their music and research who they were and what they were about and what they sang about um and, uh, you know, so that was that was very key. But just talked about how, you know, stuff gets stolen from us, you know, and we didn't get the credit for it. And, and I thought that was a very, very, very bold move by Chuck D at the time. Um, next track, Fear of a Black Planet, the title track. Dope, dope track. Dope track. Um, another banger. This one, uh, you know, again, it's the title track. Is perfectly placed on the album. Um, Chuck doesn't, <laughs> he's not going to disappoint you on any track, but he came with some dope rhymes on this one. And, and I think it's just, I think what I learned over a period of time was I, when you try to put yourself in their shoes as far as when they were creating this album, uh, you have to also align yourself with some of the things that was happening in society. So for this song to be titled that and for the album to be titled that, uh, I thought it was a brilliant move by Public Enemy. I mean, what else would you expect from a group called Public Enemy? Fear of a Black Planet. Um, next track is uh, Revolutionary, Revolutionary Generation. Um, 
this one is another 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 solid joint um the thing that always impressed me about this song was that this was just a continuation of the song that came before it. And I think what they did was, and I don't know how this was sync sequenced, but you know, these are really, really strong tracks that I think, you know, really could stand alone, but they, 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 they mesh very well with the whole concept of the album. Um, then we get the track 14. Can't do nothing for you, man. Um, another flavor, flavor joint. Uh, <laughs> um, this one was on, I want to say the house party soundtrack. Uh, I mean, I can't do nothing for you, man. You jumped out of jelly into the jam. <laughs> Typical flavor, flavor, man. Uh, party joint. Um, I love the song. They probably could have left it off, but I'm not mad that they put it there. Um, but I think this probably where if it were me, I probably would have ended the album here. And it's not is no knock on the rest of the tracks that come behind it. But I think they probably could have ended it here with the exception of maybe one song. And that would have been straight. Um but the subsequent songs, I think, for lack of a better term, there's a slight fall off in the songs, but still doesn't take away from the album. It's still an incredible album. Um, the next joint is more of an interlude. Reggie Jacks, uh, Chuck D rhyming over a very, very slow down, you know, sound like a chopped and screwed beat, but he still gets it off. Uh, then we go to track 16, leave this off your fucking charts. Um, this one, this is the only track that was not produced by the bomb squad. This was produced by Norman Rogers. Um, it was decent, uh, very solid track. Uh, then we go to track 17 B side wins again. I always like this one because they called B side. And, and for those of you who were around, you remember a side and B side. Well, obviously on the tape, this was the B side. Um, very futuristic sound. Um, I like the way Chuck and Flav are rhyming on this. Uh, I just wish, like I said, it, they probably could have left it off. It's not. I don't think it's a filler track, but it doesn't hit the way the other tracks are. Even, excuse me, it doesn't hit the, the way the other tracks do, but it's still a very, very good song. Um, same for the next track, War at 33 and a Third. Very, very solid very solid track um then track 19 final countdown of the collision between us and the damned um that was an interlude it's only like 48 seconds and then the final track track 20 fight the power um like i said earlier they probably could have got to track 14 can't do nothing for you man and then fight the power. I, I would have ended it there. I would have ended it with fight the power. Uh, fight the power is the anthem. Uh, it was the anthem of the Spike Lee movie. Uh, Do the right thing. Uh, it is one of the. It's, it's one of the best and one of the most recognized hip hop songs um, in the history of hip hop. Uh it's one of those joints, man. You you can never grow tired of hearing it, hearing it. Um, and of course, you know, they shot the video in Bed Stuy, uh, Tawana Brawley, Al Sharpton, all of them were in the video. Um, but yeah, it, it's what can I say about Fight the Power? You you know what Fight the Power is. It, it like I said, it's an anthem, and it's something that still bangs and still resonates with people to this day. And you know, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what the movement is. Uh, Fight the Power will always be a song that people will play uh, as a rallying cry. Um, overall, like I said, it's it's 63 minutes of pure unadulterated funk, pure unadulterated hip hop, pure unadulterated fused uh, futuristic music. Um, this album, if I had to give it a mic. This is a four and a half mic album. 
It's not a five because, again, I think the back half of the B side isn't as strong as the A side. Um, if you said four mics, okay, cool. No problem. You can no argument for me. If you said five, I could debate with you. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I've seen some people call this a classic. It's just a little bit short of a classic to me, but a, a, a very important album because if for nothing else, you have to look at the themes and what uh, during the time was going on and what you know Flavor Flav and Chuck were actually rapping about. Uh, I think that in and of itself makes it uh, an album that, you know, can stand alone. Uh, it's often compared to, you know, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back and rightfully so because it, you know, came after it. But uh, this is a great, great album. Um, this is an album, I think, that uh, it's been 30 years. You listen to it. It does not sound dated at all. Uh, you can still pick up and understand what it is that Chuck's rhyming about and why uh, it was dope then and it's still dope to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for me. Thank you for checking out this latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm your boy 12 Kyle. We'll catch you next time. Five G's.